okay welcome back where uh, we started off on our uh, session on uh, the code of ethics ethics and boundaries in christian counseling we quickly looked at what professional ethics mean we started looking at certain principles um, we've moved a couple of uh, um, uh, principles up until now which we will uh, review back once again uh, we just completed with confidentiality in Christian counseling. We move on to the next um, uh, next principle of cultural regard um, in Christian counseling. Um, so, you know, as, as counselors, we are going to have at some point of time uh, different cultural, um, ethnic, racial, um, uh, you know, those who are uh, racial diversity that is being represented um, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, to those who may come to minister you, to you. And these are important considerations while you are being in a place um, of counseling or any kind of counseling related services. So um, this cultural competency really signifies one is to have a at least some level of knowledge and awareness um, about the values, the norms, the traditions of other, other cultures, of other people who are being represented there. Because that in itself, these kind of values, norms, traditions can influence our, our perceptions. It can influence their thoughts, attitudes, their beliefs their communication, the way they relate to one another, certain behaviors, these life experiences, their customs, their spirituality, um, all of this. So remember that culture also does play a huge role in the way uh, a person is shaped. Now, Christian con counselors, as, as a Christian counselor, we recognize and acknowledge that every person is created in the image of a holy God. And therefore, all counselees do have the, the right to be valued and respected and to receive uh, that ethical care to be treated with the utmost dignity. So especially when, um, when you are, you know, when you're working with people of different faiths and religions or values, we do the best to we work in a way to understand that belief system uh, yet uh, and as we're doing that we're also maintaining that respect for the counselee and strive to understand when faith and value issues are important to the counselee okay so so when we, when we look at this specific principle we also do mention that we take care not to withhold services to anyone who are of a different faith or a religion or a group. And uh, the, this code of ethics actually values the counselee's decision making in counseling. So the counselors may, you may as a counselor share your own faith orientation. And that is only as a function of a legitimate disclosure, self-disclosure, and wherever it is appropriate for the counsel for the counselee. And you always maintain that posture of humility. So we are, we we need to be aware of cultural issues when you are helping a counselee. Um, and remember that as a um, you know, and and I think it's it's common sometimes to to not sense a, a form of understanding when you meet with a counselor from a different cultural background. But as a and and that's why it's um, if there is a struggle with that, you make those referrals um, outside. So in my practice, I I have seen that people do reach out, you know, from other. Uh, maybe countries or other cultures. And uh, I do mention to them that my exposure to that culture is limited. 
and maybe the ex all the exposure that I have is through some form of reading or even some form of interaction with the counselee. Uh, that's that's as much as the um, information that I have. So being able to to ex express that and uh, be integral about it, yet also being careful and humble and um, open to know that there may be a lot of cultural practices that uh, that's that's different uh, against your your um, uh, uh, against your own culture. Okay, so just being cognizant about that. So what what is it we need to do? I guess as a counselee is to have that knowledge to build your awareness about about the person who you're you're meeting and and i think it's it's a good practice to maybe go back and read about the culture because uh it it really impacts the way that you relate to them you understand them and the kind of world view that they may have okay so that there is sensitivity as well as um a, a sense of dignity as you are reaching out to them okay um yeah so i think uh, we i already spoke about this is that um yeah not uh, so for those who share their own counselors who share their own faith orientation uh should be only as a function of self-disclosure or where the need is met and you don't impose your values because when you as a counselor you um uh, you know when you as a Christian counselor, you may expose the counselee to your faith orientation, but you've got to be careful not to impose your practices on the counselee. The last one is case management in Christian counselling, or it's called, um, it's basically called a, uh, of how you would discuss and keep a comprehensive understanding of people who come to you. Now, counsellors, work to understand the counselee's belief system and you maintain that respect for the counselee and strive to understand uh, whatever is important for them so um, what you are, what you are also doing through this is when you're looking at their treatment plan or what are the interventions or the goals that need to be used there are certain principles you got to consider the uh, the first principle is it is based on one the counselee's problem or the issue the second is that you would like to promote a sense of ownership on the counselor the counselee takes ownership about their condition or their situation the third is um you know you incorporate any maybe they have gone through some assessments or some other kind of uh, counseling work you kind of incorporate this understanding alongside with your or the way that you manage them okay it is based on the strengths of the counselee you identify clear goals with clear objectives you're ensuring that whenever possible these goals are attainable and they are measurable and you're also being sensitive to other factors that may um that that uh, that have uh, factors that impinge some kind of a, uh, a, a pressure on the on the counselee and you're also providing a review and adjustment as needed so what are you doing over here is you are not just dealing with the person as a spiritual being or a physical being or a intellectual being or a volitional being you're considering them as a whole person so it's biologically, psychologically, spiritually, cognitively, culturally, relationally. And it requires a coordination of other services that is in the best interest of the counselee. So you're not just looking at them as, as emotional beings and dealing with them like that or as a spiritual being. And this is very much in line with what we spoke about. Remember when we were looking at the personality, the human personality, we said, we look at the person as a whole and don't break them up into 10 chunks and just say, okay, only this concerns me, the rest of it doesn't bother me. And that's what we mean by case, uh, case management, that you are giving them the thorough 
uh, care of the whole person. You're considering the whole person. It is a comprehensive and thorough plan. That's what we mean by case management. You know, you're managing and saying, okay, well, what does this person need in this level? What does this person need in this realm? What does this person need in this situation? And that's how you work alongside with, with, uh, with them. Okay. Uh, next and the last one is the community presence in in uh, Christian counseling, which is which uh, we know as Christian counselors, we are we play a larger role in communities as well as the society in general. So, as a Christian counselor, um, you know we we need to be mindful to present ourselves at all times as the salt and light or as the ambassadors of God because when we do so we are conducting ourselves as well as others with the utmost dignity and humility avoiding any practice or behavior that can bring dishonor to God dishonor to ourselves or to the body of Christ so we as we do this we pray that God gives us the grace to adopt this code even professionally the strength to live honorably and to see it uh, as a foundation of our identity that wherever we are we represent christ and we are called to be the salt and the light we're called to be the ambassadors of the lord jesus okay so there we completed our uh, seven um, uh, principles um, and uh, yeah just to quickly once again a run through that so that um, you know we have a we have a quick uh, a recap of what we did is so the first one is um, um, compassion in christian counseling then it's competence how we excel consent how we offer our services with absolute integrity fourth is confidentiality where we are called to be trustworthy being uh, having cultural regard that is showing dignity to all kinds of people um, um, of all race, of all culture, of beliefs. Uh, collegiality, that is where we build good relations with, with other co-members or co-professionals or co-supporters in our helping profession. And lastly, having a, a community presence. Okay. So that closes with uh, our ethics. And uh, I'd like to also bring about uh, certain boundaries that we need to be careful and to be aware of. Um, and this is something that gives, again, us a framework to find out what is safe that makes our relationship with our counselees safe, as well as what are some of the limits for the services that we deliver okay so boundaries is something that indicates a border or a limit like you know in india we have every house has a boundary excuse me every house has a boundary wall and that indicates that um whatever happens in that is yours okay so similarly the professional there is a professional boundary which we ensure to first of all for um, a counselor to be cognizant about that boundary as well as counselees to be cognizant as well okay so they're the guidelines that are based on the principles of the counselor the practitioner of of those code of ethics that we spoke about okay so we'll just go uh, uh in detail of this now what what is these the concept of um, these boundaries uh, it it gives a framework and of our identity what is uh, and what remains constant over a, a particular period of time you need to have have a specific identity what is it that what kind of a calling is that on you what are you identified um, as? Okay, um, um, like you know, even even like for example, when you see people who are doing businesses, uh, often there will be a certain <clears throat> uh, adjective that people use. Okay, there, you know, he's a corrupt businessman, 
or he's a honest business guy very integral man right so it gives you a sense of personal identity identity which you keep constant over time okay and this identity is constant regardless of any external issues or pressures or any kind of emotional ups and downs the counselee maybe counselor maybe maybe feeling okay these boundaries is like a contract that is there within the counselor and the counselee relationship and also these boundaries help the counselee to draw a line between what is myself what is the self of the counselee and what is the self of the counselor and to ensure that there is no merging that takes place okay and yeah i will explain this a little bit in in further so why is it important that we talk about these these boundaries it's one um we have the ability to better recognize boundary issues as they arise if we don't have those boundary lines if anything crosses that we don't even recognize that those boundary lines have been crossed okay so these boundaries are important so that we have a framework have a have a limit to what are things it also clarifies expectations so like the confidentiality or the consent it clarifies that expectations it also gives a clear idea of where your own boundaries are as a counselor you have a certain framework of what is what is acceptable what is not acceptable a boundaries are important because you need to have a plan of action if boundaries are in danger of becoming unprofessional or unsafe or it's in danger of moving out from that which is uh, unprofessional like for example um you know counselors who meet with counselees from a from the opposite gender uh you know there is a certain there is a boundary and is a and there is the code of ethics is you you do not form personal uh, not code of ethics the boundary is that you do not form a personal relationship with your own counselee because that becomes a conflict in itself okay so you have a plan of action if any of those boundaries are in danger of being violated at all okay it also reduces the risk of a counselee exploitation that is um you know in in some cases where the counselor himself or herself has a problem and may you know is looking at exploiting people and a counselee becomes like an easy prey but with boundaries there is uh you reduce that risk you reduce counselee anxieties as the roles and rules are very clear you let them know what is expected um what is going to take place how the sessions are going to go forward where is the meeting going to be held you know a lot of times people don't even know what counseling is about and uh, there are times that uh, excuse me <clears throat> there are times that um, you know counselees call counselors home and say you know why don't you come home and help me so if you don't have those those boundaries you know there can there can Uh, there can be significant trouble that comes about this also boundaries are important because it helps in the well-being of the counselor okay you have certain rules and principles that you follow that you can very clearly say this is outside of that and i would not adhere to it like like this the example that i brought to you about is you know calling counselors home and also it provides a role model for counselees where um, there are certain boundaries that that you maintain like for example if you're working in an organization and uh, the the counselee would like to gift you something personally or maybe gift you money right uh, as a counselor you have you're providing a role model by placing those boundaries that any kind of remuneration that comes in will go into the organization and not to you personally so there itself you are creating some of those boundaries okay so who negotiates these boundaries it's the duty of the counselor to uh, to negotiate and because that it's a it's the counselor who acts in the best interest of the counselee okay so the counselor is uh, ultimately responsible for managing those boundary lines and for for ensuring that uh, they stay clear okay and when you 
clearly bring up some of those there's a clear understanding of ethics and boundaries that you as a person are going to be holding up what are certain clear boundary areas that um, um, you you need to be you need to look into is um, ensuring that that you know that there, there aren't social activities that are planned with counselees um, now I will come uh, a slide will come where we're talking about pastoral or uh, you know church related counselling that sometimes doesn't happen because you belong to the same community um, and uh, that can of course be an issue so let's say if there is someone who you relate very well personally to ethically you shouldn't be taking them as uh, um, someone to help because there's also again an emotional involvement that is that is there so um, yet we you know there is a fine line on that Maybe in those counselors who belong to a church may not be able to completely adhere to this one. But what a counselor can do is, like for example, um, I, I know many people within, within the body of the church. Uh, and I know how I relate to a lot of them. So, I'm, so if there are people who come in and say, you know, I want to have, I want to be counseled by you when they're actually a friend, I do refuse and say, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't happen that way because there are a lot more of uh, uh, considerations when we are looking at a counselee counselor relationship. A clear boundary area is uh, having sex with counselees or having any kind of an intimate relationship with counselees is definitely a violation and it is against the ethics. Um, uh, family members or friends being as counselee is again a boundary that you is it's important that one maintains okay uh, a counselee should not be your lover your relative an employee or employer an instructor a business partner or a friend okay um, anyone apart from that is uh, you know is okay um, where are some of the areas where boundaries may blur so uh, like, like we said, a lot of these boundary issues may not be completely clear cut. It's not something that, that is well defined. And these are these can be potential areas where one needs to pay a little bit more of attention to. One is in self-disclosure. How much of disclosure does a counselor have with the, with the counselee? Okay, being careful as to... Um, how much one one gives about personal information or personal um, related lessons that one one brings about so that that's why it has to be done in absolute discretion giving or receiving significant gifts now when we mean by significant gifts expensive ones i mean counselors do come in with box of sweets or a card or you know a pen and all of that and uh, uh you know you 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 got to be you need to really look to see whether it is it's okay or you know if you're working within an organization it's always better to have them leave those gifts if they insist to have it that you have it at the um with with the organization rather than with you uh, or dual or overlapping relationships where you hold the role of a counselor as well as another relationship these are where there are blurring of boundaries. Becoming friends. When counselor and counselees become friends, then the uh, relationship in itself, the counselling relationship is uh, becomes harder. You know, the the influence, the impact of a counselor becomes definitely becomes lesser. And of course, where there is physical contact, I mean, in the sense of a physical proximity. If there is an over identification with the counselee's issues from the counselor's side, that these are the danger zones. What happens if there is, and uh, they clearly uh, feel more involved in the counselee than what is required, which is also what we call as transference. Okay, there is a significant uh, sense of identification and need to uh, to be uh, there's there's an overly need for help, overly need to help rather. 
okay, from the counselor to the counselee. Or if there's a strong attraction to the counselee's personality, if the counselor feels attracted to the personality, again, that, that also is part like counter transference. If they're spending more time with the counselee outside of work or a work area, that becomes again a danger zone. Sharing too many intimate personal information with the counselee, also, um, you know, talking a lot about personal information and personal uh, uh, material or details can again be uh, can can be difficult. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm just going to stop here for a couple of minutes just to see if if there are any questions I can address. Before. Yes, Samuel, please go ahead. Um, but I, I understand, um, you know, but, I, but I'm, 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 I've been trying to figure out why is it difficult to counsel um, someone who is a friend or a re relative? Even, yeah, why does it become so difficult? That's something that I'm yeah, trying to understand. Thank you. Because of the involvement you would have one is when when uh, when there is a friend or a relative um that there, there's probably no objectivity that is come that comes about secondly there is an emotional involvement there is a, a sense of concern uh, more than empathy it becomes uh, it, it, there is more of an, like I said, an emotional attachment with, with the with the individual. And if you remember the principles that we spoke about, it it talks about um, uh, client controlled. Sorry, if um, I have a lapse of memory, uh, it's called. Okay, just give me a minute. I'm just going to quickly pick that up. I think I've lost my head in the way. Um, principle of controlled emotional involvement. Yes. Okay. So if you remember that, that's the place where you where um, you listen purposefully to the counselor's feelings. Okay, and uh, involve yourself, but having a controlled form of involvement with the with the counselee and that's why that becomes uh, a, an issue because your objectivity is lost as you are helping them to um, think through maybe even suggestions that you make is probably coming from your known assessment of the situation because there are other people you know in that in that situation maybe Let's say a friend is coming to you, you know, his spouse, you know, the children, you know, thing. And so looking at it in the way that from from your perspective, you feel there is A, B, C, D things that need to be done. So there is no objectivity gets lost while you are dealing with someone who is more like a friend or a relative. So uh, and it could also put the counselee at a difficult position of um, not wanting to really share or open up situations. I've had a lot of people um, not wanting to see me because not because I know them completely. Maybe you know they're, they're people who are acquainted in church, but they don't want to see me uh, because they sense a discomfort as to what would one they fear confidentiality, and they would they would also fear judgment although you know even though as a counselor you may be keeping those perspectives but as a counselee this really matters you know just the understanding of who am i going to see how much of what i'm going to say is going to leak out and those are genuine fears so that is why it is it is recommended that uh, one does not um, a counselor doesn't meet uh, doesn't help their own friends or family uh, Christopher, I think you have a question. Uh, yes, Pastor, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, this, this could be uh, a related question, but uh, maybe uh, extending uh, a little more uh, in detail. Um, 
this is really about uh, the, um, the, uh, the role of the primary uh, caregiver who is uh, living with uh, a counselling and uh, trying to uh, help in uh, supporting uh, you know, the, uh, the, the counselling and also, in a sense, working along with the, the counsellor. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, not sure if you touched on this earlier, but I think sometimes that that uh, that dynamic uh, uh, is is uh, not really uh, you know touched upon that much. Uh, not just not the role itself, but I mean, you know, how best the primary caregiver can help in the situation. And um, how the primary caregiver can also not make situations worse uh, because there is a need. I mean, there is an essential need for having this primary caregiver because yeah, it's usually a, a close member of the family who lives with the um, the counselor. And depending on the you know on the, on the complexity and um, the uh, Acuteness of the, of the of the problems that the council is facing. Um, primary care, the primary caregiver definitely plays uh, an important role, mm. and is also uh, you know someone who is uh, constantly uh, in contact with council. So I just wanted to get uh, get some get some. Yeah. So uh, so uh, Christopher, I I didn't follow what your question was. I followed the scenario. So what is your how what is the what okay. Uh, tends to be the the relationship when it comes, or how does a counselor manage the complexity of a counselee and its caregiver? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, no. I, I mean, I my question is more about you know how what what would be some of the um, you know, do's and do nots of you know of, of primary caregiver in this uh, in this uh, relationship um, because. You know, the counselor and counselor are meeting maybe you know once a week or once in once a month or whatever you know depending on mm. how, how, how the situation is but the primary caregiver is constantly in, in contact with the, the counselor so what are some of the tools to do do not so okay the primary caregiver. okay all right so um, in this instance, if you're looking at a caregiver and counselee, the certain scenarios I can think of is like a parent and child, like a, uh, like a spouse relationship, and um, maybe even siblings for that matter. Um, so any any ma major re relations that are in the home. So, okay, so that's that's the kind of scenario that takes place. Now, I think an important thing for a counselor is based on the presenting problem of the counselee. Uh, the counselor needs to draw a frame of the kind of contact that the counselor will have with the with the caregiver. And, and depending on a situation, on the situation, or like I said, the presenting problem or, this, or the concern from the counselee, you take the consent of the counselee. Um, uh, so let me give you an example. Let's say it's an it's a 18 year old young adult who's coming to you for help, as against a minor who is coming to you for help. Now the minor is under the uh, legal purview of the parent. So as a counselor, there may be certain things that is important to relate to the parent because they are minors. Nevertheless, this is something that is uh, brought about in consent right at the beginning. That uh, that there may be uh, so so you're right at the beginning of a caregiver as well as the 
your your uh, counsel counselee and uh, letting either parties know depending on the assessment of the case now for example if you have someone who is severely mentally ill okay uh, you do understand that confidentiality is not something that may not can be maintained you, you're finding that a, that let's say a child is having a, a real breakout of a psychiatric illness okay and this is something that needs to be communicated to the parent because or to the caregiver because there is appropriate help that is needed however let's say the child is has no psychiatric illness is severely just has significant emotional troubles and maybe the parent themselves are the biggest issue in the counselee's life or in this child's life so what do you how what discernment do you use as to how much you disclose and what is what kind of care do you need to take so something that we do in practice is to build a counselee up to a place of confidence to begin to share important thoughts or processes about their uh, counseling journey with the parent or with the caregiver within a counseling room because let's say for example if a child is talking about how much of distress they are feeling with their with their father and without really roping in the father you do see that change or uh, um, uh, 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 you know a, a diminishing of the of the problem is is a huge problem so you you need to bring that out at some point of time with the caregiver but you do not do it outside of the consent of the child but build them up to a point where they develop the confidence to discuss some of this with their caregiver like i said in the presence of you as a counselor so that's one thing that you would do and uh, again to explain to the caregiver that the that the process of counseling is one in which the counselee is the most important part or person in the relationship and all because a referral has come from a caregiver that does not keep the counselor binding on the caregiver to give information or advice or uh, you know pull out uh, things no it doesn't it doesn't give the counselor the right to do that and that's something you would need to open up with the uh, with the caregiver as well uh, now let's say in in some issues where the caregiver definitely requires um, to know that there may be certain maybe the counselor and the counselee have come up with a plan of how they are going to do something and the caregiver is an important part of that process and something that they need to know so that again is something you would help the counselee to prepare themselves to provide that information to the caregiver so that they could be of support in the counseling relationship now i've seen if a caregiver in the first place does not regard the, that counseling relationship it can be very very difficult because you have one person on one end telling you uh, uh, you know the, the caregiver saying that you know nothing's going to work counseling is not counseling is not not needed and here on the other end the counselor is doing the best to try and help them to emote and come to have a different perspective of what they're going through so you see that becomes a clash in itself there there right so it can be it it, be, it becomes difficult when the caregiver has has does not have a buy in to what a counselor is doing or uh, you know is clueless about it so if there are important points of change or important points of you know like like you're helping the counselee do something new it may require the support 
not in May, it will require the support of the caregiver. And you find means in which how the counselee can begin to relate it to that caregiver. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, and of course, I think one of the main important things for the caregiver, again, is depending on what the situation is, an awareness as to what's going on. Uh, like, for example, let's say you're dealing with an elderly person who has Alzheimer's, okay? And uh, as a caregiver, uh, they will not have any idea as to what's going on. And they, they think that either counseling or some kind of medical help is going to really fix it. But it is how do you independently work with the caregiver so that you can protect the best interest of your counseling. So I'd say in, in different situations, it plays out differently. Nevertheless, what, your, what is your sole aim is to have the counselor, sorry, the counselee and the caregiver have similar objectives and goals. If they are divided, yes, it becomes difficult. It becomes hugely difficult to figure out, you know, uh, how how can you help somebody when their core support system seems to be drawing them away from that support and that help. So yes, that that becomes very difficult. But when you're working with the caregiver, you also help the caregiver look at what are your objectives, which you may may have discussed with your counselee. Go back to the counsel uh, to the to the uh, caregiver and discuss those objectives as to what are you trying or hoping to achieve through those sessions and how you would like their support and uh, cooperation through that. I hope I answered that. Uh... Uh, yes, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, like, as you mentioned, it's, it's quite uh, it's, you know, situational and uh, mm. could be, you know, different type of scenarios which require that the kind of uh, right. I mean, a different kind of approach just one question with regards to in case there is you know the counselee and the, the caregiver are not on not in sync with you know the, the need for counseling what would you typically do in that in that kind of scenario mm -hmm. so there we leave the choice to the counselee and especially if they are adults. Uh, because, I mean, uh, now the case is different if a caregiver wants someone to have, uh, a caregiver wants their relative to have counseling, but the counselee, but the, but the relative doesn't, or the patient themselves doesn't want to. I mean, there it's, it's, a, it's an understood thing that, you know, you, you let the caregiver know that unless and until they're prepared, and they would like to. There's nothing that uh, you you can't force them into something like that. But if it's the other way around, the counselee is willing, or the relative is willing, but the caregiver isn't. It's easier to work because you have the cooperation and the willingness from the counselor or from the counselee. Of course, if it is a minor, then that becomes difficult because you need the um, consent of the parent or of the adult. If it's a minor, then again that becomes an issue you may not be able to help much if there is a legal guardian who has refused the services okay all right okay quickly i'm just going to um just a few more i think uh, and then we'll be done um yeah so we were looking at uh, yeah, it says somebody else's. Okay, so um, we're looking uh, at. Yeah, anyone has a question? Samuel, do you have a question? Yeah, Pastor, but I don't know. I'm also aware of the time. Uh, do you have to finish? Probably I could just post it on a chat or write to you. Yeah, maybe I think if you could post it on chat, that'll be helpful. Okay. And uh, I, I mean, on the stream, on the stream. The stream. Yeah, on the I'll screen, the yeah. Screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah. 
uh, just to uh, uh, certain do's and don'ts of one is yes being able to respect any kind of cultural differences that you may see <clears throat> excuse me uh, just being careful about <clears throat> the gestures or expressions or anything that um, can be interpreted as uh, uh, as seductive or or sexually offensive is something you've got to be careful about uh, being careful not to make any comments about a counselee's body or clothing or uh, also not to engage in any inappropriate affectionate behavior with with a counselee these are all do's and don'ts uh, not talking about your own the counselor not talking about their own sexual preference their fantasies their problems uh, not requesting a date with a counselee uh, not meeting your personal needs in other areas of your life. For example, maybe, you know, your counselee has, owns a big supermarket. So you're saying, give me 20% discount from your supermarket. That becomes uh, unethical in itself. Okay. And uh, last, uh, uh, maintaining supervision or, cons or consultation relationships. So it's, it's good if there is whenever you're meeting with people to have some form of a supervision or um, a core group where some cases and issues are being discussed, okay? Um, just quickly, the role of dual relationships. Like I said, the dual relationships are those that have more than one role with a counselee, and such uh, relationships often blur those kind of boundaries. Uh, these blurring of boundaries can be... can can be risky because uh, of the risk of exploitation as these become uh, they become confused so um, again not all counseling counseling interactions are dual relationships what are not dual relationships like for example you know you run into a counselee at a social event like maybe a marriage right that's okay that's all right doesn't mean that you have to you know leave the wedding hall or uh, your counselee is a waiter at a restaurant, that also, it's okay. Um, it, what, what really matters is how you participate in that interaction, not really talking about things that should be probably spoken about in a counseling room, keeping it that for later and, you know, maybe just uh, a warm hello and, um, you know, just a few pleasantries is what is, what is important. Okay, now, just, this is, this is quite important, what are the rules of these ethics uh, and code for, for a pastor or an unlicensed pastoral counselor? So actually, by law, now I need you to remember that this is something that is more an American law than it is here. Over here, uh, we, we have, there aren't really specific laws for pastoral counselors, okay? Um, but they are not typically required to hold the similar standards of, pref of professional conduct as a practitioner but nevertheless like for example you know you as a pastor you may have uh, you know there may be one among your own congregation okay there may be multiple things that you you know about about the family there um, so generally a licensed or a, or, a, or a professional counselor will not see more than one member of the same family for for personal counseling like you do not personally counsel the the husband on their issues and the wife on their issues and the children on their issues because it can again become a conflict of interest uh, but as pastors or or uh, pastoral counselors you recognize any moral or in uh, or ethical imperatives that exists as part of your ethics so all of those boundaries that we spoke about the consent um the confidentiality all of that continues to exist maybe uh, a lot of these roles that one plays may be a little more blurred but uh, it's not typically it's they're not held sim to those to those standards okay all right uh, i think someone has a question kennedy did you have a question yeah yeah thank you very much yes uh, what i just wanted to ask you is uh, maybe it could vary from place to place so it could be on case to case basis just talk about the issue of uh, charging professional fee mm. or how you levy or how you charge your clients can you give okay. some guidance because you see this is more of a prolonged kind of case when you're handling things. right 
Right. Okay. So um, I, I think it in as in any other profession, it is important to be able to charge a fee. Uh, so just just to give you an example of us at uh, at the counseling center at APC, we do charge an, a very very nominal fee, and uh, this this is this more than than actually the charging of the fee. It is for the sake of an accountability for many reasons. One is accountability that, uh, you know, this is not just something that you freely come to just talk about and spend your time and, uh, you know, just chat over. It is something that is very structured, something that is very meaningful, something that's that has objectives and goals in it. The second thing is it increases the uh, accountability of the person of the counselee themselves that the the very fact that they they are also investing in it for their own health or for their own betterment or for their own uh, growth uh, that's something that that we do uh, we do uh, hold rightly um, the the third thing is also that um, uh, that this this is one like you said this is something that goes in probably for many people take this take these sessions for a long period of time so just to have have that uh, profession I'm, I'm i'm saying it is professional but i'd say that ethical professional consideration that this is also something this person has learned and studied and researched and you know spent time in in working so you're actually consuming the time of a counselor there, like a Christian counselor, you're consuming the time of a Christian counselor when they could have actually done something elsewhere. So personally, I think it's a personal take that it is important, even if it's a really nominal fee, to bring about a certain charge for these sessions because it helps like in this in objectivity, in accountability, um, as well as a respect for what the person's doing. So that's my personal stand. However, I know there are some Christian counseling centers that um, that have pro bono sessions that do not take in money at all. So that's that's probably their principle, and that's fine also. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, so we have come to the end of our course, and. Um, yeah, I don't think there are any questions. Yeah, so it's been it's been wonderful. I I really hope you know some of you have got a got a stronger interest to in this and pursue it in some way, and um, you know learn more, maybe get trained more in just the, because it absolutely has enriched my life and the way that I've related to others, uh, and I pray that God would each. Uh, use each of you um, in wherever you are placed to minister, to encourage, to strengthen others. Kim, let's just close with a word of prayer. I'd like to pray today, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the last five months that we've journeyed together in the course on counseling. Lord, thank you that uh, every principle, Lord, comes from your word. Lord, we pray that you give each of us a heart to minister, a heart to serve. Lord, a heart that is compassionate. Yet, Holy Spirit, we pray that you give us the wisdom and the discernment to deal with people. May we be careful to not make choices and roadmaps for others. But Father, may we be so keen to be willing to help people to come up with their thoughts, their understanding, their ideas. And yet, Father, give us the ability to bring them to a place, to a juncture of change. Lord, I thank you for these skills and knowledge that we've picked up, Lord. Lord, I pray for each person who've attended these classes, each student who've attended these classes, that you will put your spirit in their hearts, Father. And wherever you are calling them to, that you will bring to remembrance things we have learned, we've picked up, 
and lord that their ministry would be efficient lord would be productive because of some of these skills that they've used i pray father that that you will help each one of them give them a discerning heart and mind and spirit to understand problems to draw out concerns lord to challenge people and their ways of thinking be present and empathetic in times where they're feeling low father you give them these skills thank you father for the opportunity that you've given me to interact with each one of them lord i bless them in your name and i pray that you will open doors for them where they can employ and use all that they have picked up may none of this go for waste may none of this knowledge and understanding go for waste but be put to the right use for your kingdom thank you because you will place each one of us in the right place at the right time in the right season to minister to those who are hurting i thank you lord i just bless each student here their families um uh, and and their ministries their work their responsibilities god we i pray that you flourish them for all lord for all that you have entrusted to them for the obedience they've showed through this through the course for the uh, for the accountability that they've had i pray that you will exalt them reward them mightily father thank you for your goodness i pray also for the e learning students for all those students who have uh, who have uh, logged in week after week master i pray that you will reach to them you will touch their lives god and you will bless lord the, the work of their hands thank you once again father we await god um, your will in our lives especially as we minister to people thank you master we ask all these things in your precious name amen amen thank you all so much amen thank you god bless thank you all thank you please ensure that you finish your assessment before uh, tomorrow thank you god bless thank you ma'am thank, thank, uh, thank you thank you pastor thank you thank you so much thank you thank you thank you pastor thank you thank everyone god bless